Good morning, family. My name is Charlotte McGrew. I'm First Lady of Higher Praise Family Church. It is good to have you this morning. If it is your first time tuning in, make sure you hit that subscribe button and also that thumbs up button. Uh, don't forget, family, stay connected within your small group this week and also tune in on Wednesday for Bible study. Let's go ahead and go for our morning scripture this morning. Our scripture is found in James 5, 13 through 15. If any one of you is in trouble, he should pray. If anyone is happy, let him sing songs of praise. If any one of you are sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Now let's pray. Dear God, we confess our need for you today. We continue to ask you for your healing grace and your power, oh God. We are reminded that you work on our behalf, especially for those who you love and that you are called, Lord God. Forgive us trying to fix things, Lord God. Forgive us trying to put things before you, Lord God. Forgive us spinning in all kind of different directions, Lord God, because you are the way, you are the truth, oh God. Heal broken families, Lord God, that are going through things, oh God. Cover broken places. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come down, Lord God, and to be a comforter, oh God. Let us hear what you're saying. Let us see what you're doing. God, we just worship you on the day, and we thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing, oh God. In this time, in this season, in this place, oh God, we just say we love you. We give our all to you, oh God, that you are the only true and living God and the only way, oh God. And we just bless you. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to Higher Praise Family Church. I'm Justin. I'm Amara. And these are your Sunday morning announcements. Join HPFC in Israel Recognition Sunday each first Sunday of the month. A special offering will be taken up and given to Israel as we eagerly expect to see what God sees. Romans 15, 27 says Gentiles have shared in Jews spiritual blessings. They owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. We sure hope you will join us. Join us for corporate prayer and Bible study. Check out our Facebook page for more information. Hello, family. I'm happy to see you again. Please, here are a few health tips that can keep all of us safe as we go through this time of the coronavirus. Make sure we're being conscious of, I go to work every day because I'm a healthcare provider. If you stay at home, that keeps both, both of us safe. If you stay going out and not doing social distancing, then you're putting yourself and me at risk as well. Have a question during pastor's sermon? Drop your questions in the chat window. Be sure to reach out to these saints this week and show them some birthday love. This concludes our morning announcements. Make it a great day and a significant week. Wait just one minute before we continue with service. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Take a quick second, scroll down, and hit that big red subscribe button. And hit that little bell too so you're notified when new sermons are posted. Be sure to stay connected through the week by visiting us on Facebook, listening to or watching the latest sermon either through podcasts or YouTube, or visit our website. Good morning, higher praise. It is time for an offering. Again, our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts 20, 35b, the last part of that verse. And it says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't it an awesome thing to be a giver? The Bible says, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So here we have in Acts 20, 35, giving us this reminder, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so at Higher Praise, we are a church that still believes in tithing, 10% of your increase. Um, as faithful stewards, we give as a, not as a debt that we owe, but as a seed that we sow back into the kingdom, back into this house, back into this local assembly, as things must continue to go on. Amen. And we're not surviving. We are thriving in these times. And you as faithful stewards help us to thrive by your gifts. Amen. So again, return a tithe unto the Lord, which is 10%. 
We also, as we talked about, and we'll talk about in today's sermon about giving a sacrificial gift. Again, that is a gift. So when we give an offering unto the Lord, that suggests, number one, that we give to a superior, that God is greater than us. And so watch this, because he is greater than us, he's able to give back to us. Amen. And then number two, we give a sacrifice as an act of submission. So when we give our offering today, it is a reminder to God, Lord, that we submit unto you. Also, just as a reminder, we give through Givelify. So again, download that app. If you have not already, most of you have, um, but give through Givelify. Again, if you need to mail in your tithes and offer, you can do that to the church at 2909 Horton Road, Forest Hill, Texas, 76119. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We give back to you in faith, knowing full well that if we give unto you, you will give back unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Also, don't forget, you did not able, we're not able to participate last year, not last year, last week on our anniversary, our fifth Sunday sacrifice. You can still do that. Those spaces are still um, available on Givelify, our fifth Sunday sacrifice, as well as the sweet spot. Give because we are givers and cheerful givers. Amen. We have been won over. Um, God bless you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Higher praise again for 19 years. You have been faithful stewards and we are here because of your faithfulness to God and your faithfulness to stewardship. God bless you. We want to sing a song today and invite you to sing along with us. And we want to, in, to remind you that even though we're going through this whole pandemic thing and we're, we're not sure what the outcome is going to be, we can still find comfort and assurance in the fact that God loves us. And that no matter what's going on, he's going to take care of us. He's going to provide for us. He's going to bring us through. So let this song minister to you. Let's reconnect with the reckless love of God. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me yeah. and before I took a breath you breathed your life in me You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, 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 the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night in I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, how we love I felt no word. I felt no word. 
Well, good morning, family, and welcome to Higher Praise Family Church. Again, if you are here for the very first time, we say welcome to the fam and to Higher Praise Family Church. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for staying connected. Um, God is truly still doing awesome things in our midst, even in light of these uncertain times. Um, so again, want to welcome you this morning to the word. Um, we're coming from Genesis chapter four, verses one through nine. And I have tagged this text Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis chapter four, verses one through nine. Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Canaan. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked with the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked on favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? 
Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I do not know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of your son, Jesus. Thank you for another time and opportunity um, to assemble in this new format, um, but you are gracious toward us. I pray now that you would illumine our hearts and our minds, make our hearts ready to receive that which you have a portion on this day. We give you praise in advance in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. In light of our theme for the year, truth that transformed in our current global circumstance and season um, today, I seek to inform us about the big picture and our role as citizens of God's kingdom in the midst of our uncertainties in our present culture. If we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, we must realize that first of all, it is a global pandemic. Therefore, it impacts the nations, it impacts the world and not just our nation. Therefore, if this pandemic is global, our perspective also must be global. I suggest that our perspective must be a kingdom perspective rather than a church or denominational perspective. And although I'm not against denominations, um, we must realize that denominations cannot speak to, again, what's going on from a kingdom perspective. Um, at first glance, when we look at our text this morning, this particular pericope of Cain and Abel may not seem to speak to what we are facing and dealing with today. However, as we uncover the truths that transform, we can see that what is going on and what happened in Genesis is apropos and relevant for what happens today. If we look exegetically, historically at Genesis number one, we realize that Genesis is the book of beginnings. It, is a, it has history, although it is not a history book. The book of Genesis was written and compiled by Moses while he was in the wilderness of Sinai. Of course, this is accepted by church um, tradition as well as Jewish tradition. Um, also, we realize that Genesis was written to encourage the Israelites while they were preparing to enter the land of Canaan. Let me suggest here that proper deportment is apropos for the lives of believers. In other words, there is a way we should act as the children were preparing to go into the land of promise. God was preparing them. He was equipping them on how they should manage life and lifestyle in this new place, this new promise. So I suggest today that there is a way that believers and citizens of God's kingdom, watch this, should be acting today. In Genesis, this text is relevant and it applies to that. Number one, let's look at the message of Genesis. There are different, I believe, messages throughout the book of Genesis. Number one, we see that Genesis talks about Abram, the father of our faith. And so we must realize, number one, that the God of Abraham and Sarah is the same God that created the universe. Also, we realize through Genesis and the message of Genesis is that all have rebelled against God and at some time have refused his goodwill. Number three, Genesis informs us that God is a loving God, but he's also a God that judges. Can I suggest that it is God who has the sovereignty, the ability, the virility to judge and not man. And then number four, sin is the adversarial culprit that seeks to separate humanity from God and humanity from humanity. Ergo, the Bible via Genesis reveals God's redemptive plan for humanity. His replan for righteousness as the antidote to restore man's relationship with God and man's relationship with man. Let me first, um, before we delve any further, um, dismiss or suggest, I believe there, is, there are myths that we um, generally operate by. Number one, the general world consensus, I would suggest, is that religion is the antidote to dysfunction. I'll say that again. Religion is oftentimes seen as the antidote to dysfunction. In other words, if we could have a form of religion that will cure the ills of society. I would suggest the second myth is actually in the church. The church would suggest that particular denominations and their perspective that they have cornered the market on the revelation and understanding of God. In other words, each group of denomination would suggest that the, the, the doctrine 
and the protocol that they espouse is the total revelation of God. And so many times denominations believe that what they have to say is all there is to be said about God based on their perspective. Can I mitigate these myths today and suggest, number one, that righteousness, not religion, is the real antidote to dysfunction? In other words, righteousness via proper relationship with God and proper relationship with man is the antidote to dysfunction. Number two, can I suggest that the kingdom provides a platform for righteousness to thrive? In other words, the kingdom, not denomination, is where righteousness truly thrives. Number three, the church provides the platform for equipping those who profess faith in Christ to live as citizens of God's kingdom. And also it is a recruitment platform for citizenship into the kingdom. In other words, God uses the church to usher people into the kingdom. Matter of fact, John three and three, I believe, supports this word, says that no one can enter the kingdom unless they are born again. As you know, I suggest um, suggest and teach from what I call a dimensional approach. There are three dimensions. God created the heavens, the earth, and he filled it. Um, dimensions in the sense that we are tripartite beings, mind, body, and soul. When we look at the creation of the tabernacle, there was the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies or the most holy place. And so when I look at scripture, I then, through the panoply of scripture and doctrinal tenets, I look at it from a dimensional perspective. So when we look at this dimensional perspective, we can then apply this dimensional approach. Therefore, denominations would represent the outer court. The church universal could represent the inner court and the kingdom, of course, would be the holy of holies or the most holy place. So it's this dimensional approach that we apply and that I apply biblically and theologically throughout the themes and throughout the panoply of scripture. Our text today reveals the deeper truth and reality of Ephesians 6. And I believe this is important as we look at what is going on in our world today. And I know and realize that uh, many of us, based on the camp we may be in or based on the perspective we may have um, politically, it's not my call. I'm not a politician. And so I don't really get into politics I, as a pastor and a prophet. I believe my responsibility is to exegete properly the word and how we as citizens of God's kingdom can be equipped to live life and life to the full in these times as believers. So when we look at Ephesians 12, again, very familiar. The Bible says in Ephesians 12 that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, against spiritual wickedness in spiritual darkness, watch this, in the heavenly realms. Um, therefore, when we look at contextually um, this COVID-19 virus, it is unseen. We can't see it. Therefore, it is equated to that which is spiritual. And so we must then, what? Fight spiritually. And so when we look at um, the context then of COVID-19 and what's going on, um, it's not, um, I'm baffled when I look at different news venues and um, different news channels. Um, there's a lot of time spent on the blame game of who did what or who did not do particular things. The bottom line is uh, what we are dealing with has, is, is not steeped in man. It's steeped in spiritual warfare. And so I want the church to realize as I address higher praise this morning, higher praise family, I want us to realize we're not fighting against Democrats. We're not fighting against Republicans. We're not fighting against Trump. We're not fighting against people. We are fighting a spiritual warfare. And we must understand that. So the um, as the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty unto God until the pulling down of strongholds. Are there any believers in the house this morning or in your own house that would agree with me that the weapons that we have, we are more than able to not just survive COVID-19. We are able to thrive through it because we have what we need to be successful. And remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear or phobia. We don't have to panic. We don't have to be terrorized. We don't have to be paranoid because he has given us what spirit of power, love and a sound mind. So I release the spirit of a sound mind over higher praise and those that may be watching. Yes, you should be careful. Yes, you need to do what the CDC and the World Health Organization have prescribed as protocol for safety and regulations. But listen, we do not have to walk in fear or terror because we know who we are and we know whose we are. Amen. Um, again, as we look at Ephesians 6, it suggests that the source of this viral assault is not steeped in a person, a group or an organization, as I've stated before, but it's steeped in forces in evil and the unseen. 
in the heavenly realms, that which is beyond earth. The spiritual forces use people as ambassadors, just as God uses citizens of his kingdom as ambassadors. So although we don't fight against flesh and blood, we realize that our adversary will use flesh and blood to carry out or to execute the plans of the dark world or the underworld. The source then, again, we say is spiritual. And also um, Ephesians 6 goes on to inform us that we fight against authorities, powers, and rulers of darkness, which suggest that the opposition is not only unseen, but it is strategic. So we must realize that we have, yes, we have a strategic fight. It is spiritual, but it is also strategic. Therefore, number one, that suggests as a, as a strategic war that those and the war that's been waged against, again, not again, a particular people, but against the world in the sense of the body of Christ is that it is knowledgeable. So we are fighting against a power against darkness that has knowledge, that has information. Number two, it is organized. Therefore, it is practical. It is not haphazard in its approach. It is not haphazard in its strategies against coming against us. And so we must realize again to number three, that it is powerful. In other words, it is influential. So the, so the strategies against us are knowledgeable, strategic, organized, practical, and powerful, influential. And so if we step back and pause and look at what's going on in our day and time, we can recognize and realize that yes, all of these are in conjunction and working in tandem against um, who we are and whose we are. Therefore, I suggest, as I suggested earlier, that our weapons and our response must be spiritual rather than carnal. Well, let's look at our text this morning. When we look number one and two um, verses one and two, it suggests that we look at we see Cain and Abel. Let me suggest that Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel represent number one, good and evil, but also religion versus relationship. So the text says about Cain, we have introduction and what I would call and suggest is characterization. Cain, well, who is Cain? The Bible suggests and tells us about Cain. Cain is a tiller of the ground. That means that he is a laborer of the ground or he expands considerable energy and intensity and task or function. It also suggests, another definition suggests that he has watched this enslaved to the ground or he is an indentured servant to the ground. Ergo, it speaks of his connection to what he does. So Cain is the one who, again, is the opposite of a relationship with God, would suggest based on his character and the characterization based on the text is that Cain is connected to his own works. In other words, Cain is connected to or a slave to his own labor. He's he's a slave to what he is able to produce rather than what God provides. I'll say that again. We see now context that Cain is a slave to what he himself can produce rather than what God provides. Abel, on the other hand, watch this, is a keeper of sheep. He is a keeper of sheep. The word keeper there suggests that he is a friend of or he is in association with and attends to or is an associate with an association with the intents or vices of another. So in other words, Abel has become a friend of sheep. Now, it is this um, profound. So Christ, what does Christ say in the New Testament? He says, I no longer call you slave. I no longer call you Cain. I call you Abel. I call you friend. That's profound. So we see prophetically, even now, if um, John 15, 15 asserts what Christ now says to his disciples, I don't call you servant. I call you friend because I don't keep secrets from you. We are in right relationship. We are in righteousness because we are relating to each other correctly. Ergo, we see prophetically. The relationship between Cain and Abel, again, representing good and evil, representing religion versus relationship. And so watch this. Uh, we now have a preview. What I would suggest is a foreshadowing of a relationship of righteousness, how Abel is in right relationship with God. Cain is in an improper relationship with God. So we see this this diametric opposition of religion 
on one hand with Cain, who is acceptable and enslaved to what he himself does. And then you see, we see Abel, who is one who is in right relationship with God based on being a friend of sheep. Verses three through five, I would suggest shows us then how do we have a proper sacrifice? The text goes on to say, of course, that Cain offers a sacrifice. Abel offers a sacrifice. Cain's Abel is not, um, sacrifice is not accepted. Abel's, on the other hand, his sacrifice is accepted. First of all, number one, this word sacrifice um, comes from the Hebrew word mena, where we get the word sacrifice or gift. Um, and it suggests a receiving is by one who is superior. And also it suggests that the gift is an act of submission. So sacrifice, number one, suggests that what is given, we give the gift to one who is superior to us. And number two, the gift is an expression of my submission. It goes on to suggest that Cain gave, watch this, fruit of the ground. And so um, ground comes, watch this, from the word Adamah. So that's where Adam, or why Adam is named Adam, because he comes from the ground. But he gives, watch this, fruit from the ground. And this text is specific in the Hebrew text. Fruit suggests not a particular fruit, but he gives any fruit. In other words, he offers any produce. So he, he's not very selective to go and find the best. He just says, I'm going to offer something that has come from the ground. Now, this is also important because ground also suggests, if we look at um, another translation of this Hebrew word, it also suggests underworld or region or the under region or below ground. So not only does he just give Cain, does he just give something or anything that he just without thought, without intention, just gives. But watch the source. The source of what he gives, watch this, is from below. It is from the underworld or the under region. Whereas Abel, on the other hand, watch this, it says he gives the firstborn or he gives the oldest portion. And so the, the definition here also suggests he gives the best portion. But watch this, there's also another definition of this best or the oldest. It also suggests, if we look in Psalm 17 and 10 and Psalm 73 and 7, the same word for the best portion or the oldest or the choice portion also is defined in the Psalms as callous heart. So watch this, here's the deeper teaching. Abel gives not only the best portion, but he also gives his callous heart. So why then, here, here's the answer to the question, so why then is Abel's offering, sacrifice, his gift accepted? He says, Lord, I submit to you by giving you a sacrifice. But watch this, how do I know it's a true sacrifice? Because I give my best, but watch this, I also give my calloused heart. And so watch this, here's the deeper teaching, that our giving, watch this, will de be diminished if we're not giving with the proper heart. So you've got to sacrifice not only your best, but you've got to give God the worst of you. So when we talk about truly giving a sacrifice, yes, I know we're familiar with when bringing the tithe and bringing the offering, but watch this, you've got to bring God your calloused heart because that's what's going to give significance to what you give out of the abundance or your best part. So Cain then and Abel are diametrically opposed because one gives from the place of what he does on his own from the lower region. Watch this. Abel gives not only the best portion, but he says, Lord, I realize in order for me to truly give, I've got to give you the bad part of me. I've got to give you my heart so my heart can be changed. So what's the issue between Cain and Abel? It's not what they give, but it's the source from which they give. Again, so if you're giving from a lower part, if you're giving from the under region or that which you suffer for, that which you do versus giving from your heart or your calloused heart saying, Lord, I sacrifice, I give you my heart. Again, that makes the difference in the world. Well, Patrick, is that really is that really biblical? Yes. If you go to um, Corinthians, second Corinthians nine, um, six to seven, where the Bible, watch this. Um, the Apostle Paul teaches us that the Lord loves what a cheerful giver. Now, this word cheerful. Yes, it is translated hilarious or one who laughs. But watch this. The metaphor for a cheerful giver is one that has been persuaded or won over. 
That's good. So the cheerful giver is not the one who gives an offering or a sacrifice with laughter, but the one that has been won over in his heart. That's good. So Abel, watch this, represents the one that has been won over in his heart. Why? Because he sacrifices. He gives his heart to God in addition to giving what has come from his hands. He gives God what has come from his hands, but he also gives God his heart. And so I suggest this morning, if you have not given God your heart, what you give him with your hands, watch this, will not be acceptable. Ask Cain. And so watch this as we go to verses six and seven. Here's the pedagogy of God, what I call the pedagogy of God. And so we know this um, um, just like Christ um, in the New Testament, he would ask his his disciples questions to teach them. Whom do you say that I am as an effort to teach them? And how many people know that when Christ and when God asks questions, they already know the answer because God is omniscient. He's all knowing. So if he asks a question, he's really not asking for information. He's asking to make a point. So here's the um, the Socratic pedagogy of God. So he asked Cain, Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? This text is loaded. Watch this. This word face fallen, of course, um, face suggests the front in the Hebrew or it also suggests the head. So he says, why has your head fallen or why has your the front of you fallen? But watch this. This word face fallen. Watch this. It also suggests it also means watch this from an earlier period or earlier times. So he's saying, Cain, you're from, he's not asking a question, he's stating, Cain, you're from an earlier time period. Well, what is this earlier time period? God, what what could you possibly be talking about? I'm glad you asked. Watch this. What did Jesus say in Luke 10 and 17? He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Again, this is a direct reference to Ezekiel 28 and 12, where the Bible gives us a depiction how Satan is kicked out of heaven. So watch this. What God is literally telling Cain is, Cain, I see you and what you are displaying, your religion versus relationship, watch this, is the same thing that happened in heaven. It's the same thing that Lucifer did. He was with me, but he was not in me because the Bible says, watch this in Corinthians. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So watch this. Lucifer was in heaven, but he was not with heaven. He was around God, but he was not really in God. And so therefore there is a fall. And so watch this. So Cain, watch this, is operating from a place of fallenness. That's why when he gave his offering, the Bible says he's given from what? From the underground or the underworld. You can only give where your source is. I'll say that again. You can only give from your source. And so God says, I want to deal with your heart. He goes on to say, watch this. He goes on to say via a question. He says, isn't it true that if you do well, you'll be accepted? In other words, again, he's not asking a question from information. He's teaching Cain and giving, watch this, he's preaching to Cain the gospel. He's preaching him to him in an effort to watch this, to bring him to another place. So he says this, watch this. He says, if you do well via question, will you not be accepted? So he's saying, watch this, so turn it into a statement. He says, if you do well, you will be accepted. Well, how do you do well? The word do well means there in the Hebrew to means to do good. Watch this. It means to be friendly. In other words, you need to be friendly, not based on the act, but it must be steeped in your heart. So when you give God your calloused heart, watch this, and you give him your hand, your sacrifice, watch this. Now that is the transformation that is required to be acceptable unto God. And so he says, um, Cain, if you do good, if you are friendly, the New Testament suggests and translates this word friendly as benevolent, where we get the word benevolence, where we is actually benevolence is steeped in, watch this, agape. Agape, for God so loved the world that he gave. Agape love always seeks to meet a need. And so he gives and suggests in the New Testament that benevolence is equal to love. In other words, when I meet people's needs, that is an act of love. Love is not a feeling, just an emotion, but love is meeting needs. So God tells Cain, if you do benevolence, if you are friendly to your neighbor, if you do the right thing to your neighbor, watch this. He says you will be accepted. The word accepted, watch this, means to be lifted up. 
In other words, why does he suggest you need to be lifted up? Because you gave from what? The lower region or under the earth. And so now he says, if you do good, if you do benevolence, if there is a change of heart, watch this, you will be lifted up. You will be lifted from the lower region. Man, that's good news. He says, he goes on to teach. Watch this. He says, if you do well, if you do benevolent, watch this, you will be lifted. He says, sin is always crouching at your door. And so sin um, speaks of the moral standard or an offense to the moral standard. And so watch this. It is dualistic in nature as well, because sin also suggests that there is a purification or sin offering. So in other words, at the same time, you have an opportunity. There is sin, but also there is a payment for sin. So he tells Cain, if you want to be lifted, you've got to choose the right one. You've got to choose, watch this, the sin offering. You've got to choose benevolence in order to be lifted. Why? Because sin, if you don't choose right, sin is crouching at your door and it wants to, watch this, rule you or dominate you or have dominion over you. And so, again, it speaks of God's desire for man to be in right relationship with him in right relationship with man. And so he says, Cain, I can fix the relationship between you and your brother, but me and you have to be right first. And so here's the model. Here's the formula that righteousness is right relationship, being a right standing with God. When I am in right standing with God, I can be in right relationship with mankind. And that is the teaching there. And so he says, you can be raised, you can be lifted, but the way to be lifted is that you've got to get your heart right. Verses eight through nine speaks of the concept of keeping. I'm going to suggest it is the concept of keeping. And so he says, of course, we know that Cain and Abel, after this exchange, Cain and Abel get into it and Cain kills his brother Abel. God then comes and asks him a question. Where's your brother Cain? And he says in reply, your brother Abel, he replies, man, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Of course, we know this is a ubiquitous yes. We are our brother's keeper. The word keeper suggests protector. He says, am I my brother's protector? So why does God ask him about protecting him? Protect also means to cause to state to cause a state or condition to remain. In other words, when we're talking about being a keeper, not only should we realize that we're called to protect our brother, that we're also called to help our brother. Watch this to remain in a particular state or condition. It is up to us to help to make sure that at this time in the season that the body of Christ remains, number one, protected, and number two, that the body of Christ remains in its proper state, position, and condition. Let me say that again. It's very important. So as citizens of God's kingdom, it is our responsibility to make sure that our brothers are protected and that they are sustained and maintained in their position. One thing that I believe is counter culture and counter the kingdom is that we notice and see, which is like the spirit that Cain operated in his own devices, his own strength, his own power is hoarding. Hoarding is destructive to the brother because it causes individuals to focus on themselves rather than your brother. Now, don't get me wrong. Proverbs does teach about being wise and about preparing for the future. But there is a line between being wise and preparing for our future and hoarding. Hoarding suggests that I've got to do all I can to protect me and mine versus looking out for my brother. No one hoards to give. People hoard to keep. And hoarding is a sign of lack of trust in God. And watch this unrighteousness being in a wrong relationship with God. I don't trust God to meet my needs. I've got to do it all on my own, to hoard on my own and in proper relationship with your brother that I don't care if no one else has me, myself and I, I have. And that is religion versus relationship. Dr. Martin Luther King, it is, I think it's profound and um, a reality that you no, know, we're in April in April 3rd of 2018, uh, we celebrated the 50 year anniversary of Martin Luther King's um, I've been to the mountaintop speech where he delivered the night before his assassination in Memphis, Tennessee. 
That night, King reflected on some of the most significant biblical themes of the entire civil rights movement. Number one, the interrelatedness of humanity, that human life, he suggested, the, one of the main things of the civil rights movement that we often forget about is not just rights for me, but really the essence of the civil rights movement was the interrelatedness of humanity. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King goes on to say, as it relates to this interrelatedness of humanity, he says that we are our brother's keeper because we are our brother's brother. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. He goes on to say that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. For King and for us today, we must realize, accept and own that we are created in the image of God. And as image bearers of God, we have a significant responsibility to care for each other and a significant stake in each other's well-being. That is profound. And that's what um, this text is about. Am I my brother's keeper? And so, again, as we look globally, I, I pray the, the pandemic is global. So I pray that we would be, take this opportunity to seize this opportunity and realize that there must be a global or kingdom response to this global pandemic. I believe just like when we turn on world news, we see that other countries are involved, that other countries are impacted. Um, we realize and help us as a church and the church and the kingdom to get back to a global perspective and realize that we're just not our Baptist brother's keeper. We're not just our Methodist brother's keeper. We're not just our Pentecostal preach, um, keeper. We're not just the charismatic brother's keeper, that we are our brother's keeper. And I believe I've seen glimpses of it even in our own congregation as people have blessed our family, people who have not necessarily been connected to the church lately, but they have called and said, hey, you're on my heart, you're on my mind, uh, I just want to bless you, just want to bless your family. And even as members have been a blessing to me and my family personally in this time, um, financially and through food and through giving of, watch this toilet tissue and cleaning supplies. Man, it has been awesome and profound. I'm seeing glimpses of it. And I pray this is um, the um, uh, invocation of a, a, of a church revival. And I believe we're living in the last days. And God said in his word in Joel 2, that in the last days, I will pour, watch this, pour my spirit on all flesh. So I just want to remind us, church, that this um, pandemic is a reminder to us that we are our brother's keeper and that we are called to not just impact people that look like us, people that sound like us, people that talk like us. We're called to impact and help those who do not look like us because we are all connected. If you look at um, the book of Acts at Pentecost, there was um, people from all over who experienced Pentecost. When we look at the Tower of Babel in Genesis, there were people from all nations who built the Tower of Babel, Tower of Babel. Then when we look in Revelation, John said, hey, um, I saw a number that no man could number. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue will be assembled in heaven. So this, is, I believe, is an opportunity for us, the body of Christ, the kingdom, to realize that the agenda, the kingdom agenda is bigger than our denomination. The kingdom agenda is bigger than our local churches. That's why many of us can't go to the brick and mortar of our local churches, because the kingdom is bigger than that. It's bigger than that. And God has called us to significance in this time as being our brother's keeper. As I look at this text, there are a few theological points I want to make um, as I'm coming to my second close. My second close. Number one, Cain shows us that sin tempts and succeeds in denying human interrelatedness. That sin seeks to come in and separate us, number one, from God, and then also separate us from each other. Number two. The kingdom and the future hope in heaven includes not just Americans, but every tribe, every nation, every language. And number three, righteousness is revealed as God and man and man and man in the right and proper relationship. So how do we live this out? I call it um, the theology of our neighbor, the theology of our neighbor. How do we put this into practice? Well, number one, I think if we look at um, what. Um, the CDC and our government has suggested and proposed as proper protocol to help us combat COVID-19 social distancing. Can I suggest that social distancing can be spiritual? I'll say that again. Social distancing can be spiritual. Number one, because it looks at the obje objective of social um, distancing is 
not necessarily to protect you as an individual, but to what? Protect others who may be more vulnerable. And I believe this is teaching from Henry Nowen, the wounded healer. And so um, social distancing helps us or causes us or suggests for us to operate from the motives of this. Number one, that I am sick. I'm infected. Number two, I'm infectious or I'm contagious. And number three, I'm ignorant. I'm unaware of others' vulnerabilities. And that's really the point, because I may not know that you have underlying sickness and disease. I may not know that you have certain vulnerabilities. I wear, I social distance myself, or I wear a mask. Watch this, not really to protect me. It is to protect me, but foremost to protect others who may be more vulnerable than I am. And so when we look at Henry Nowen and this um, concept of being a wounded healer, I believe social distancing allows the body of Christ, watch this, to be wounded healers. When we realize that I'm infected, we realize, number two, I'm infectious, and we realize, number three, I'm ignorant. So what does it cause us to do? What is the protocol? Number one, we are to self-quarantine, and we have to realize that we can be isolated but insulated. I'll say that again. We can be isolated but insulated. In other words, the, the isolation says that you go to your home and isolate there. You go to a place where it's you watch this. I believe that isolation and insulation are, 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 are powerful, that although I may be by myself, I'm insulated, that God has provides in my isolation. He provides an environment for wellness. Isn't that good news? That if, if you think about it from a medical standpoint, when there's real surgery that needs to happen or there's there's serious, you have a serious medical condition, there's a waiting room for other people. But you go into the operating room and could this isolation be a place where God just wants to deal with you? Man, that's good. In other words, if God is going to help us to transition to, to go really not be a Cain, but to be an Abel and offer the proper sacrifice by the submission of our hearts and our lives. He can't do it publicly. So maybe God has taken us from our church walls. <laughs> Isn't that an oxymoron that God would take us from the church? Watch this. He would take us from the church walls and church buildings. Watch this to do church in us. Maybe he's calling us to isolation, to insulate us. Maybe some of the things we thought, some of the things that, you know, our perspective, maybe those are the main things that was keeping us from our real relationship with him. Maybe now that I'm isolated, he will insulate me with a real relationship. And that's what righteousness is all about. And so we realize then that self-quarantine, a place of isolation, is really a place of insulation. And it is an environment of wellness. Number two, self-care. That um, this place of isolation is also not just self-quarantine, it's self-care. So watch this. So what is the prescription? What is the medical regime for self-care in this time of isolation? If you have symptoms, number one, they say rest. You just need to rest. So maybe it's a time that we've been so busy and I get it. Our lives are busy. How many people are working two jobs? How many people are working a job and then going home and getting online, going to school? How many people, you know, come home from work and then have been taking the kids to different places in the ball games, and our lives have been so busy and maybe the church and Universal is so tired that we realize we haven't even recognized how tired we are, that we have lost our effectiveness because we've been fatigued. I'll say that again. We have lost our effectiveness because we have been fatigued. We've been burnt out. We've been tired. We've been lethargic and have not really realized how ineffective we are because we've been so tired. So now the prescription is rest. Chill doesn't mean don't do anything. It means from your own toil, Cain, that what you've been trying to produce, that what you've been trying to conjure on your own efforts, that what you've been trying to 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 manipulate on your own um, with your own hands and with your own doing. Maybe it's time for you just to rest, have a Sabbath in the Lord and allow him to breathe new life into your relationship with him. Allow him, watch this, to breathe new life into your relationship with your family in an effort to what? Have proper relationship, which is righteousness. Man, it's profound. Paul even says this. 
that it would be a shame for him to preach the world and lose his own soul. And some of us as believers, we've been doing ministry. We've been on praise teams. We've been traveling the world evangelizing and our homes are in a are wreck. We've been going and preaching the word and our marriages have been falling apart. We've been going and doing church, doing ministry, going to church um, conferences, feeling wonderful, looking wonderful. But our own personal lives, our health is dysfunctional. Our families are dysfunctional. And maybe he's saying rest so he can breathe new life back into you to have a proper relationship, a right relationship with him. Not only do we have rest, but it's time to deal with symptoms or deal with issues. And then last but not least, I suggest after we rest, after we deal with issues that we're called to deal with, the things that we've been too busy to deal with, now's the time to deal with relationships. Now's the time to deal with, you know, our own personal issues and of lust or our own personal issues of pride, our own personal issues of, of passivity. God is saying, I want you to be proactive in dealing with your issues. Deal with the symptoms now that you're in isolation. And then last but not least, develop a strategy to live with what you're living with. <laughs> this, this is profound. This is probably somewhat um, comical. Some of you have not had this much time with your family in a long time, and you forgot what it's like. And some people are now watching this show, and you're having problem living with what you are living with. Or watch this, who you're living with. And so maybe this is an opportunity for God to get you to a place to deal with issues so you can reconnect as husband and wife, reconnect as a family, reconnect. As, as, you know, as a person that's single and how to deal with, you know, family members, how to deal with you as an individual and how to deal with you and your maybe your um, your child or daughter as a single parent. And so now's the time to reconnect. So uh, how can I be my brother's keeper? How what is what is, I'm calling this the characteristics of brother's keeper? What are the characteristics of being your brother's keeper? How do we live that out? And so we talked just talked about um, number one how we can, again, um, be neighbor, be a better neighbor through, again, spiritual social distancing. But now how do we become really our brother's keeper? Number one, there are rights of a keeper. As a keeper, if you're going to be your brother's keeper, number one, you must realize you have rights. What is that right to be productive? What are you producing in this season? Again, I'm telling you, pick up that pen and paper. There's a book you need to write. There may be a business you need to start, but you need to be productive if you're going to have as you have rights. Your second right is to rule. In other words, you have you have rule over that sin is not going to dominate you or should not dominate you. You should rule over it as, as God told um, Cain, you can rule over, you can dominate your issue. Do not have to dominate you in the, or rule over you in this season. And then number three, you need to have dominion. You are, are in control. In other words, you don't have to operate in fear. We operate in faith in this season. Next, there's rights of a keeper. Then there's a role of a keeper. What is the role of a keeper? You are a priest, prophet, and king. You are a priest, prophet, and king. Those are your role. As a priest, you are an intercessor. As a prophet, you speak and declare the word. And as a king, watch this, with a scepter of righteousness. In other words, with proper relationship is how you get along in society. Then there are three responsibilities of the keeper. What is the responsibility of a keeper? If you're going to be your brother's keeper, there are responsibilities. You must have insight. Revelation from God. You must have foresight. You must impart to others. And then you must have hindsight. You must declare. Declare those things that are be not as though they already have been. Responsibilities of a keeper. And then last but not least, what is the resolve of a keeper? What is the resolve of the attitude? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is love in action. Peace is faith in in action, the just shall live by faith and joy is hope in action. First Corinthians 13, 13. So, again, as I said, and I promise this is my last close um, when we talk about spiritual warfare. So what what are we fighting against and how do we fight against it? Number one, I suggest that this religious spirit that has been pervading the church and the kingdom and has been attacking um, the citizens of God's kingdom. We see in Cain. The spirit, number one, of animosity. Number two, the spirit of anger. And number three, the spirit of rejection. Again, I'll say that again. I'm going to deal with these more in Bible study on Wednesday. The spirit of animosity, the spirit of anger, 
and the spirit of rejection. The spirit of animosity suggests that there is a deception of difference. In other words, what keeps us from being, being our brother's keeper is that we have a spirit of animosity like Cain had, where we suggest that we are not family because we're different. Do not allow your differences to keep you from being your brother's keeper. And oftentimes our differences is what makes the difference between us helping and walking away. Number two, the spirit of anger. Anger is the deception of dependence, the deception of dependence. People will not be or citizens are keeping from being our brother's keeper because we are determined that we are not family because we are dual. In other words, the enemy wants us to suggest the enemy wants us to own that because we are different, we're dual. In other words, we're battling against each other. And then number three, the third thing, the third spirit that is in operation against keeping us from being our brother's keeper is a spirit of rejection. And this is the deception of decision. The deception of decision says that we are not family because we are independent. In other words, like Cain, we suggest I can do it on my own. I can grow my own crops. I can do what I want to do because I have my own strength. Can I suggest that these three spirits, again, can be mitigated against with faith, hope and love. And so then the clarion call to be my brother's keeper, the clarion call to be my brother's keepers. If we're going to mitigate against the spirit of animosity, if we're going to mitigate and defeat the spirit of anger and the spirit of rejection, we must understand the clarion call of being our brother's keeper and accepting the call of being our brother's keeper with faith, hope and love. So the gift of hope is a theology of my neighbor. Who can I help? Who can I help? Number two, the gift of faith, the theology of salt. What can I preserve? And then number three, the gift of love, the theology of light. What can I reveal? So when we begin to answer and live these questions out through faith, hope and love, who can I help in this season? What can I preserve in this season? And what can I reveal in this season? We begin to engage in true spiritual warfare in this season and accept the calling of being our brother's keeper. Well, let me take this time and I want to pray with you, pray for you, pray this word for you. Um, want to remind you when we or inform you when we get off this call, there is our our prayer warriors are available for you to pray with you. Um, to agree with you, to stand in the gap with you. And that call is available. You can see it on the line now, on the screen now. Um, pick up the phone, call that number to our prayer words, our intercessory prayer team. They are available now to pray with you. Father, I come in Jesus' name. I thank you for this time and opportunity. Thank you that we are our brother's keeper. I pray for those who are watching now who uh, would accept the call and the mandate and maybe they're here and need to be born again, need to be saved. I pray by faith that they invite you to their heart, invite you into their lives, and that not only, not only give what's in their hand, but they give you their hearts and become acceptable unto you. Father, continue to bless not just higher praise, but every church that stands open in your name as we deal with this pandemic. Give us strategies for healing, wholeness, and wellness not just in the body of Christ, but in our world. We pray for the nations now. Thank you that this is a kingdom mandate. We pray for the nations that you do something profound in this season. And I thank you that the body of Christ is not just going to survive, we're going to thrive. Thank you, Lord, that the best is still yet to come. God bless you. We love you. We are praying God's best for you. Be encouraged in this day. Be encouraged in this season, knowing that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God bless you. Are you interested in making Higher Praise Family Church your new home? Head on over to the website and hit contact us in the top right corner. You'll get added to our church roster and get plugged into a discipleship group. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Higher Praise Family Church and our YouTube channel. Can I admonish you, please subscribe to our channel and share it with your family and friends. Also want to invite you to follow us on social media as well as visit our website at www.higher-praise.org. 